Hi, everybody. Uh, RJ and I are super excited to be here. It's amazing to see so many familiar faces and faces that will soon become familiar and friendly. So that's awesome. Um, we are here to share our learnings, maybe some failures, and um, talk about how everyone else is just wrong. Uh, my name is Nicole Wilker. I'm an Agile practitioner at Red Hat, and I've been doing Agile forever. I'm not going to say how many years. RJ can for his. Um, uh, I've been everything from a scrum master to a coach to anything in between that's asked of me. Um, and tons of experience with teams that have gone well and have gone wrong. And yes, hello, my name is RJ Hynek. Um, I have been at Red Hat for 11 years as an Agile ambassador. I've worked in multiple organizations as an Agilist, a Scrum Master, Agile coach, a team coach. I've worked with leadership and I've worked with teams at all levels. Um, I do have a few certifications. I'm very proud of my uh, CTC, it's Certified Team Coach. That one took me the longest. I have a lot, but I don't collect them because I like having lots of letters behind my name. I collect them basically because I like, I'm a lifelong long learner and I believe that we have to get out there and you just look at all the different models that are out there, gather them and uh, not, a, I think many of us here believe this, but it's not a popular opinion that we can mix and match and find what's right for our teams. I think, did I have more? Oh, <laughs> so why are we here? Oh yeah, that, yeah, Hi. that's the kind of important Hi, thing. RJ. Okay, so we're here because um, we wanted to, to take you through some, some experiences, some thoughts that we had around uh, dealing with forming a team. We know that when you're forming a team, you have a lot of different personalities. And um, we, what we've noticed is, is that it can be really difficult sometimes. And we kind of explored the idea. We'll talk about this a little bit more here in a second. But we wanted to explore why are some personalities so far to one side or the other, and why do we end up in, our, in a, a place where people say things like, well, everyone else is just wrong? All right, um, so um, why are we here? So at the end of this conversation, of this presentation, we want you to be able to identify either where you stand, where you don't stand, maybe some folks in your teams that you might want to help or give some ideas to and um, give you a, a path forward. Again, being on a team, making a team, it's hard. Uh, constantly in an environment that is changing, super hard. Uh, some of us are in that now and constantly. <laughs> um, so yeah, forming, reforming, and creating a team. So um, we realize that this is the Agile track, but we're actually not going to be talking about Agile. We may use some Agile terminology as we go through this, but we're not going to stop and explain anything. Um, this isn't about training. If you are interested in talking about Agile, both of us love to do that, and we can do so after the session. But this is primarily focused on um, team formation and the struggles that we deal with when we're forming teams. Is this a place where I could say and everyone else is just wrong? I don't think so. Okay. You can say whatever you want. Yeah, okay. Um, so what's, oh, that's you. Yep. All right, me. Hey, so what's wrong? Um, RJ and I spent some time thinking about this idea of everyone else is wrong. We delved into two distinct personalities, shall we say extreme personalities. We even did the empathy map with the little head and the feelings and seeings and doings and sayings to determine who these people were. Um, so it was a very insightful exercise, and we came to the conclusion that we are not actors. So we will be talking about our two personalities, and um, as we take those two personalities, the extremes, we're just going to be focusing on three topics today. There's a lot more, but today is just three, of team dynamics, conflict, and metrics. So... My character, who I was going to act as, but now I'm just going to talk about him and put his hat on every time, is Peter. Peter believes in the Agile principles, but Peter believes in them to the extreme. They are rules. He, the, 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 the way they're structured to him is a beautiful, a connected globe of principles. That they're, And anybody who tries to do anything out of the principles is clearly wrong. He doesn't believe in mix and matching 
at all. Um, the scrum guide is the Bible to Peter. And that's just how he looks at it. And, <laughs> and everyone else is just wrong. We saw everybody just get their pictures taken, like, and we figured we'd be blathering and not look good. So. I win. Yeah, there you go. Now, <laughs> now it's done. All right. So I'll be taking on the persona of Emma and talking about where she fits. Um, she is very into empathy. Okay. She feels that people are what she, she really focuses on. Um, so she's more interested in the people than at the actual work that they're going to be doing, knowing that if she gives them the support they need, they, she assumes they will succeed. Um, energy in motion at its simplest level to her is uh, energy moving in and on the body. So feelings are physical sensations, and that's how she thinks the world should be because everyone else is just wrong. <laughs> All right, so Peter also believes in balancing data and using data and collecting it and measuring with all of those principles. And he's actually had pretty good luck at it, which having that good luck makes him feel like, well, he must be doing the right thing. Um, he also, uh, he doesn't berate people with data, but he really focuses on just the facts at hand. Anything else is extraneous. He doesn't like emotions. He just likes to have that data. He gets it. He loves to work with the team and say, hey, here's where we've had some weaknesses. Let's talk about the problem. So he actually avoids assigning blame because he's using data. So he's doing things right, but he tends to take it way too far and just focus on the data. He doesn't always explain what's happening. And I think we've all seen what happens when you're expected to collect data, but no one's ex told you why. And everyone else is just wrong. All right, Emma knows that everything starts with feelings and thoughts. Um, so she can hear the words not said when she's having conversations with her folks or the other people on her team, and she can see the storm on the horizon. Uh, she feels that feelings are a good input to the work and decisions to be made, and understanding more of just the facts can help the team bond, they can grow and improve. So... Sometimes Peter puts the data before his people. In fact, he does so much that he doesn't really even look at his teams as a bunch of people. He refers to them by the team name. It seems very fun and exciting when he does that, but he might not even be able to name all the people on his team because he's so focused on let's get things done. He's one of those people that they seem really excited and very driven, but he focuses so much on the goal at hand and the data we're using that he forgets that there might be some differences in opinion. There might be some people with different backgrounds, and he doesn't really allow that. Because of that, psychological safety takes a hard hit when on teams that Peter's on. And because he thinks psychological safety is also something that people hide behind, he further erodes the psychological safety. So he creates this cycle of... Yeah, he's driven. Yeah, he's, he's helping us move forward with data, but he is not a people person to the point of being painful. And we'll really get into that here soon when we start talking about team dynamics. All right, so on the op opposite side of that, Emma spends so much time with her people, she forgets that if we're trying to make changes, if we're trying to improve, you need to know what you want to improve, where you are with that, and how you might get there. So she's missing the boat on that one a little bit. All right, so we, we mentioned we're gonna come at this from two different perspectives. And what I'm hoping everybody keeps in mind is that um, these are, ex we're experimenting with these characters. These are people slightly out of balance. They have good traits, but they're just not altogether right. And I'm willing to bet that we've all had someone on a team that's like this, where they upset the balance. So that's what we're going to go into. We're going to show how these two work. And we're going to actually ask you to raise your hands if, if you agree with one side or the other. Or not. Or not. So what we're going through is first team dynamics, then we'll go through conflict and conflict resolution, and then metrics. All right, starting off with Peter. Team dynamics. 
normally, the, the way we originally did this, I, was, I would switch into the role and actually begin acting, but I'm a terrible actor, so I'm just going to wear the hat. So for Peter, he's really pragmatic. He hears the expression, um, we, should, we should all be a family together, but that drives him insane. He doesn't believe in family at work. In fact, he believes in work-life balance. He has a family at home. He doesn't need another one. So he doesn't want to have this sense of, well, he refers to it as kumbaya moments, much like, well, we'll Emma will cover that here in a moment. Um, so Peter also, um, he struggles with... Uh, how we're going to join, how we're going to connect, um, to the point where he just doesn't even care about it. I, I, yeah, I think that's fair, right? Um, other, other traits that happens when, when, team, when Peter is trying to deal with team dynamics, um, he doesn't believe in celebrating um, the big wins for the team. He believes in celebrating when the product goes out, and he wants to celebrate the product. It's an odd sort of shift in his brain, because the way he sees it is, we are celebrating the product, but he's not naming names and he doesn't want to celebrate the people. He wants to celebrate what we did. Not that we did it, but that it was done. This is an odd twist. And of course, everyone else is just wrong if they don't do it that way. Right. All right, so for Emma, if the team has not gotten together and has not started off on the right foot, they're not going to get where they need to go. They're not going to release a product. They'll never get there. <laughs> so some of the things she sees if the um, team dynamics are not going well is possible bad communication or no communication. Uh, do we have clicks? Do we have people that are just not inclusive of their current teammates or new teammates after a reformation or new formation? And there's no trust, either bottom up, top down, or between the teammates, and that can really... Uh, cut away at what we all want to complete. Um, so deferring to a single person. Anybody read the Phoenix Project? Who's that? Who's that guy? Who's the author of Phoenix Project? No, the dude. The dude that's a bottleneck. Brent. Brent. Yes, yeah. him. Yeah. So we we don't want any Brents. That can really keep a team from succeeding. Um, if we have unclear or unknown goals because of the communication problems, then we're never going to get to the release. So there's going to be nothing to celebrate. And then for conflict avoidance, we want the, she just wants the team to be happy and be able to move forward and uh, just not really jibber-jabber. OK, so who's with Emma? Oh. Who's with Emma? You don't have to be. All right. All right. Who's? Who's, who's with Peter? All right. Oh, okay. nice. OK, cool. My data went today. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, we did the Peter and the Emma, and now we're coming back to how can we bring Peter and Emma together and actually get something done. Um, so you need a heart and a compass. So you need the relationships and the data to move forward. And everybody knows that you don't always love your family, <laughs> but you're stuck with them, kind of like your team, right? Um, um, Going off script, uh oh, going off script. Just, uh, does anybody uh, feel like answering the question, um, what could get Emma closer to the middle or what could get Peter closer to the middle? Anybody have any ideas? No pressure. Okay, that's okay. That was an experiment. Not the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, I think we touched on or might have touched on um, team contracts versus and or social contracts. Um, so I'm going to take a failure bow. I recently uh, was with a bunch of agilists, and we failed to do either. And it was painfully obvious that those, they are spot on, and you need them when you have conflicts. Oh, somebody else too. Um, yeah, so uh, you need to have the understanding. You need to understand how you're going to deal with these things and be a team. Next up is you, right? Okay. Did you want off script? <laughs> All right, conflict in a team. So for Emma, she doesn't like conflict. She doesn't like it when people are not um, going toward the same thing. If there's infighting, if there's personal t attacks versus uh, questioning of the work, she just feels that the project can fail because the people have not come together. 
Uh, she feels that research has shown that it'll lead to absenteeism, turnover via attrition or termination, and then team chemistry can be completely threatened and the team will be unable to get to their goal because the team will no longer exist due to the conflict that can happen. So for Peter, it weirdly, the two of these characters agree that conflict is bad. We don't agree that conflict is bad. Peter and Emma believe that conflict is bad. Peter's perspective, however, is that conflict is people putting their own needs before the team. Um, conflict is people just being uncooperative. It's uh, just selfish and entitled to behavior in many cases for him. Um, he believes it's uh, um, a firm leader or a firm deci decision maker can bypass all conflict. That's how it should be. That's how his father did it. That's how his father before him did it. Um, so Peter just struggles with conflict. He also realizes that conflict means that there's emotion, and you may have already picked up on this. Peter's not so great with emotion. It's, it's, a, it's a weak spot for him, so he just completely ignores it, crushes it down, and wads it up in a little ball, like you should, because <laughs> everyone else is just wrong. All right, who's with Emma? Who's with Peter? All right. Hmm. Strangely, all male. <laughs> all right. So conflict, how do we move forward? Um, you know, we need to remember that the definition of healthy conflict is fostering creativity, personal development, and stronger bonds. Um, it's an opportunity for the team as one to understand other viewpoints, to lean in with curiosity, understand why you might be getting triggered by somebody else's opinion, and find a way to see new things. It can keep us away from groupthink, and we can move away from bias. Uh, there was a recent email about if we crush all conflict, we're sending the message to teams that everybody should be thinking the same way, and we don't want that. So for Peter, the most, well, actually, outside of Peter, I'm taking the Peter hat off. So um, getting to that place of dealing with conflict and actually being okay with it is one of the most powerful things you can do. And um, I, my favorite thought process is think of a time you've had a hard argument with someone and, and you actually get it resolved. You don't just stay mad at one another. How much better you feel, how much closer you feel, because there's trust that gets... Um, Develop there. It's based trust based on forgiveness sometimes, but it's also just based on um, a sense of connection and a sense of understanding each other's boundaries. You just know each other a little bit more. So that sounds great. It's really hard to get there, and, and it takes a full team to deal with it. Um, our Emma and our Peter are people who will kind of pull us in the wrong direction, so we have to figure out how to work with them. And Peter, being a very data-driven person, you may be able to get him there by, I don't know, show him incremental improvements in particular areas. Is there anything else? Let's drive on. All right, now, back to my warm, happy place is Peter. Metrics, I absolutely love metrics. Um, there's a reason Lean uses metrics, talks about measurement, talks about you cannot do something unless you start with a baseline, you build your baseline, you build, you cannot tell if you're improving unless you have something to measure. These are all very happy places. Um, he loves to actually work with the team. So when he does that kind of behavior, people are like, oh, we're actually getting better because of Peter's heavy focus on these metrics. That's great. The problem is he's more focused on, um, where's Clement? Is he in here? He didn't make it. That's right, he had to leave. He's more focused on outputs rather than outcomes. They're easier to measure, they're much more immediate, and you have your data. Um, he, he likes to be able to take a sprint and look, break it apart into its pieces with all the data that you can gather, and so he comes up with some good areas to focus on. One of the things that Peter does best is have the team talk about the problem, not about the person, because it's data. So 
he's, he can be very persuasive to make people feel like, hey, we've got what we need. And there is nothing wrong with that, except that Peter takes it that one step to the side too far, and he won't get to the emotional side of it. He won't get to the congratulations. He won't get to the what are we going to do about it, the fear that actually helps us often do things. So Peter, poor Peter, he still believes that everyone else is just wrong. All right, so for Emma, she feels that nowadays weapon, uh, weapon, metrics can be weaponized. Uh, honestly, I've had multiple different conversations during these three two weeks uh, that, um, t- days, it feels like weeks, have uh, horrified me. Um, I heard that there's a team actually using story points and stories to tie to bonuses. <laughs> and I've heard of another uh, manager that would like uh, to get a dashboard so that they can har- harass and berate their employees. Yeah. So uh, you can see where she's very um, unwilling to just dive into the world of metrics and uh, just putting it all out there in case it can be used in the wrong way because everyone else is wrong. <laughs> all right. Who's with Emma? Oh, ooh, all right. All right. Who's with Peter? Peter. Oh, a couple. Okay. Don't don't point him out. You mean Jimmy? <laughs> Jimmy, you can. That's fine. All right. Um, so how do we how do we um, sum this up? So um, when you measure the right thing, when you talk to your teams, when they decide what they need to change and how they want to change it, and how the measurement and metrics can work to get them there, that is the right way <laughs> to use metrics. Uh, a friend recently reminded me of Goodhart's Law, that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure, kind of what I was talking about before. Um, my other favorite story, which I didn't tell until now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so there's a, uh, a manager comes down to the bullpen. The developers are behind, like two months behind. They need to deliver. He's like, that's it. You're all working the weekend. Had enough of this. So I am going to come by. I'm going to make sure all your cars are in the par- parking lot. You know what happened? They went next door to the 24-hour plant and paid each of those guys 20 bucks to park in their parking spots. So when the manager came by, what did he see? A full parking lot, which is what he asked to measure. (laughs) So just think about that when you ask people how they want to measure, what they want to measure, and what they want to improve. Yeah, so um, one of the things that, that about Peter that is interesting is that Stories like the dashboard so you can berate somebody would have make, upset him because he, he believes data is so important that we all have a responsibility around data and it should be used responsibly. Because um, using it that way, that's, you're being a terrible data scientist. Your car's in your parking lot, what a moron. Because he didn't, he didn't align what, what they really wanted to do. Um, now, Peter's problem is that he doesn't share that with everyone else. It just says, this is what I want, and doesn't talk about it. Now, fast forward to what is, what is healthy behavior. Um, so we've beat this horse a little bit, but I think it needs just a tiny bit more. And that is data has to be used responsibly. You cannot, you cannot tell people they've got to collect data. You can't scream for velocity without explaining the how it will be used for them. What is the benefit for them? If it's... If you're going to use phrases like, so that we all can roll this data up, is you're going to terrify everyone. Um, yeah. Just leave, I will just leave that there. Um, yeah, moving on. No, we're good. All right, so what's our common ground here? Well, having a well-rounded team dynamics helps a team get to their goal. We saw where Peter could be a little not emotionally open enough. We also saw that Emma may be a little too... Emotional. There's there's finding the happy medium, and you can you can actually have those people on the team, but just have them find their connection, find their, I guess, that middle ground. All right. Um, so opposing views, conflict. It's okay. <laughs> um, opposing views are valuable, but need to be approached from a space of confidence and curiosity. So as we mentioned, you you need to lean in, lean into why leaning to what the other person is saying, and then find the common ground. 
And finally, measure the right thing with the right people at the right time. Um, that's the other piece of it we didn't, I won't, I won't mention any names, but uh, there is this issue with deciding to start measuring things right after some things happened that made everyone afraid. Not a good time to start measuring performance, or calling it performance measurement. Terrible idea. So it takes some time to stop and say, all right, what is the right thing for us to measure right now? Um, I think that seems like a no-brainer, but apparently it's not. Um, but we're, we're all here, and we can keep spreading that word. All right, final thought. Um, so you need kindness and curiosity combined with measurements and practical, practical activities to create the best path forward for well-formed, engaged, and successful team. So basically, we started with an idea of two extreme personalities and how uh, they could be on a team and maybe where you might be fitting there. So in our time together, did you find anything of interest? Did you find an action that maybe you want to implement on Monday with any of your teams? You don't have to say it, but think about how, what changes, what small changes you might make to move us forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> so the question was, <laughs> any tips on how to deal with when Peter is your manager or above? Got it. <laughs> um, I have found uh, that if you ask them what it is they're, they're asking for, sometimes it's the language of metrics itself. I'm assuming we're, I'm just going to go straight to that as an example. When someone says, Let's, we, need to me, we need to measure this, or give me the metrics. I realized recently that when that, that kind of phrase gets thrown out at you, they might not be asking for the actual data itself. They might be just asking for, what's your plan for, get, for getting the data? They might actually be asking for, so how, what are you going to measure? When are you going to measure it? And how are you going to make it useful? So it turn, turns it from a conversation of a date into a let's dive a little deeper and, and what is it you're really asking for? Are you asking for what population I'm trying to measure against? What is the ultimate outcome of the data? And I, I have found that if I turn that conversation to that direction, it, at least for a little while, it means we're going, <laughs> we, we have a good, clear conversation and things can get clearer. And that's about all I can say about that. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> Asking for a friend. Okay. So the the question is if you've got an Emma and a Peter and they've they've decided that they don't want to try to find a middle ground, how do you help them get there? Oh, nice. <laughs> Nicely done. Um it's just gonna, it's gonna take time. You're gonna have to be curious yourself. You're gonna have to sit with them and find, find them in middle ground yourself, one-on-ones, and then maybe bring them together and find a thing they can agree on, one small thing to then grow from. He's like, I'm yes, <laughs> and. Um, the, the also asking questions, getting them to open up um, to, 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 and to model the behavior with the rest of the team, right? It's not just a team. I'm assuming it's not just a team of an Emma and a Peter. It's hopefully you have more than just the two of them. Um, and to model the, the good behavior elsewhere because it can be very contagious. I think we've all had an experience with that at one time or another where you reach that critical mass where we're actually being productive. We're actually being excited about what we're doing and we're cooperating. The Peters don't shut down. The Emmas don't shut down. They, they, they find that, oh, I'm a valuable member. Some of what I do, Peter being the data guy, finds that his, people do value his data, and he's, he is part of a team. Emma gets everybody to bring it down a notch from the business speak and actually gets them talking about how we as a group of people work together. At least I've had that experience. I'm lucky. I might be just lucky in that. Yeah.
yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the question is, yeah, the question is um, how do you uh, determine what is the right thing to measure as a team and, and how do you get the team to come around to deciding what it is they need to measure? Did I get that about right? Okay. Um, do you want to start it off or I can? Okay. I'll make it go. Um, sometimes um, I definitely have teams that won't have retros, but if you have retros, you'll see something and you'll say, hey, do we want to talk about this? And what is this telling you? Um, and how, how might you move forward toward getting here? Um, but it's going to, um, Clem's five whys <laughs> um, might be a good, good path down getting them to find what they want to improve. Um, but in the storming phase, um, I don't know if anybody else was ever a scrum master in their previous life, but actually getting a team to get to the, you know, maybe just three topics on a retro board, like, that's not day one. There's 85 different things that could be wrong with this team. So you just got to find something that they can agree on today to look into and decide what does good look like for that. And I'll add, um, this is might come as a surprise for anyone who knows me, but tooling actually can help. Um, I know, I know. I'm not saying that tooling is the answer, but I have often found that if I have oftentimes a good tool, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Oftentimes a good tool um, that has, you've collected data, even if it's just uh, your estimation and your throughput, and maybe you've got five or six sprints worth of work, you can actually have a really good conversation with your team about you know, why is our high and our low so far apart, or are they getting closer? It all depends on the, the maturity of the team. But even in a burn down, if you've, got, if, if you've initiated that with your team and you're actually using burn down data for the sprint, it is a great conversation to sort of introduce the team to say, hey, couldn't help but notice at stand up, I couldn't help but notice last sprint we trended in this direction. This is what I'm noticing now. I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing. Does anybody want to talk about that? You're just putting the data out there as an evaluation point to talk amongst ourselves about. And it, it instills a bit of trust, surprisingly, because the team's like, oh, they're sharing data that's our data, but only with us. And I have found that to be really powerful, so powerful that teams, the following sprint, say, hey, remember, halfway through the last sprint, you asked that, how are we doing now? When you get a question like that, you know that you're actually using data for the right reason, because people like it. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, uh, if a, a developer creates a bug and then assigns story points to that bug and, and then gets, I guess, essentially credit for that bug, um, and is that something we want? Um, the rules I had back when I was a Scrum Master with my teams was we didn't, give, we didn't put points on bugs that we had created in the previous or any time recently. If we were pulling up a bug that was from beyond the team, Yes, it became treated like a, a story. But we're getting into the technical details of, of how we deal with points. But the short of it was, if you broke something, you don't get to give yourself credit for fixing it. Um, but. Thank you for that. Oh, did I, did I repeat the question? I'm sorry. Did, OK. Any other questions? Oh, we are? We got one minute? All right. Well, then. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it's late on a Saturday, so thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it.